Well, if projections are correct, the S&P 500 could see the largest earnings decline this season since 2020. Yet the few companies that have reported have surprised to the upside with better than expected earnings per share and revenues. With a packed week of earnings ahead, what can we expect? Let's bring in Lori Calvacina, head of U.S. equity strategy at RBC Capital Markets. And Lori, companies always beat estimates by and large, but, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. but then you have the tone, you have what they say about what's coming next, et cetera. So we've been asking a lot of people the question about whether the bar is high or low coming into this earnings season. So I feel like from a sentiment perspective, the bar was low. Um, if you look at forecasts for 2Q, 3Q, and 4Q, they've all been drifting down. So we don't have a lot of optimism about the out quarters. A lot of the you know sort of movement to raise this year's numbers has come from the beats that have come in so far. So I do feel like if things are better than feared, um, and I think that's really potentially something that could happen on the margin front. I think people are having a very, very tough time forecasting margins right now. Um, then I think you could see you know some good feeling come out of this reporting season that doesn't mean it's going to be sustainable through the end of the year um, I do think you know we're a bit above my target so we, we are looking for some pullback at some point but I don't think you're going to necessarily get it right now so not right now then when are you expecting to see a pullback so one of the things we're watching really closely closely are sentiment indicators for both individuals and um, institutions. And so we watched the CFTC data on the institutional side, asset manager positioning and e-minis. That's kind of like seventh inning. Um, you know, there could always be a rain out, right? You could always go extra innings, but it's getting elevated, but it's not quite at that hold your nose and sell signal yet. Um, you know, to kind of put it more specifically, if you look at individual investors on the AAII net bullishness data, they do that survey every week as well. That's been around 50 15% on the four-week average, 30% on the four-week average in favor of the bulls is where you get nervous. So that's another late innings indicator, but not necessarily, you know, kind of bottom of the ninth. You know, speaking of where we are, one of the charts in uh, a recent note of yours caught my eye, which had to do with how the S&P 500 does during recessions and also in advance of recessions, yeah. right? And so what did stocks anticipate and when? And what does that imply about when that recession is coming? So it's a really confusing issue. I talk to a lot of investors who are just scratching their heads over the rally we've seen this year. And I take them through our sentiment indicators, which have been constructive up until recently, our valuation work, which mm -hmm. has been constructive. And they say, OK, fine. But if we're having a recession, how could the market possibly have priced it in before a recession even started? And historically, you do see the market bottoms about four and a half months before the recession is over after it's already underway. So you get that mid-recession pivot. It, you know, but people are right on this point. And, you know, what I've told people is you have to think about what kind of recession this is, if we even get it, by the way. I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. Um, and so we've been pointing a lot of people back to 1945, which was when you had a pivot out of a wartime economy to a peacetime yes. economy. 1945, I've done this study multiple times. I've been a strategist for 20 years. I can never figure out the decline in the market associated with that recession. And as we went back and dug into it, we realized there are a lot of similarities with today. Um, it, back then, it was a technical recession. The underlying economy was okay. Consumption was strong. Private investment was strong. You had a big withdrawal of government support on the fiscal side. We got a decline in real GDP. We did have some inflation that was pretty strong to contend with back then, although it retreated a bit in 45. But the more and more you look at it, the more and more similarities you can find. And we've said, look, you know, people keep pushing back on the idea of a recession because they say, well, the consumer data is still pretty strong. Companies' earnings are still beating. That's sort of similar to what we saw back then. I think the market can be mature enough, um, you know, to kind of use that term to say, OK, if this really is just sort of a technical recession that we have to endure to get back to normal, maybe we don't need to have a big disaster in the market. You said if we even get one and it's not a foregone conclusion, what is your analysis baking in? Is it baking in a recession now? Our earnings data actually is and our valuation model is. So we layer in consensus forecasts as tracked by um, you know, one of the major news organizations out there. And it's got negative GDP on a quarter over quarter basis baked in for the latter part of this year and has for some time. Even then, we're still coming up with 219 on earnings. Um, and what we found on the valuation side is that that it's really the moderation and inflation that allows multiples to get re-rated and move up. GDP and PE multiples have a lousy correlation with one another. We do bake it into our model, but it's it's kind of a you know a factor you can ignore to be honest. Um, Bloomberg put it out this morning that if you look at um, strategist forecasts for your end, they're pretty negative, right? And yeah. even though you sound pretty bullish, your forecast is not necessarily very bullish. Like. 
How, why not? <laughs> so, so I'm a numbers nerd, right? Mm -hmm. And so I basically have this rotating list of models and we come up with, you know, things that cross asset models, for example, are pretty conservative right now because they say, hey, the bond market looks more attractive than the equity market. You run, you know, those kinds of models, it's going to give you, you know, a pretty negative number versus where we are now and kind of a flattish to negative number for the year. Equity only, you know, kind of indicators like that sentiment model I mentioned before was really, really bullish to start the year. So we're looking at all those things. And when we come up with a target, we're generally taking the median or the average or something in the middle, and we call that our base case. But we have been highlighting, look, you know, our more constructive models right now can get you up to 47, 4,800. And I think what's tricky with this time of the year, right, is these targets we're supposed to guess where the market ends on December 31st. Um, it's not about where we go in September. It's not about where we go in November, although some trader just try to declare victory, you know, if you, <laughs> if you hit their target um, at something other than December 31st. But weird things often happen in the fourth quarter. Weird things often happen in December. And mm -hmm. I think the risk I see right now on the sentiment model, again, it's kind of seventh innings, not eight mm -hmm. innings. We have another couple months like this. We have a nice summer. We're going to start looking really extended on one of the models that was really bullish to start the year. So that's where I'm struggling right now, to be honest. I see the case for moving up more. Mm -hmm. I can, you know, I can see how my target's going to be too conservative. Yeah. And we'll have to be humble about that if it happens. But we do see overbought conditions returning on some of the things that got us here. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll put a pin in that conversation. Lori Cavasina stays with us.